Welcome. This is the last lecture of our first chapter uh, on vibration isolation. And in this last lecture, I would like to treat active vibration isolation for transient excitation. And if you look again at the tasks, because there were two tasks, uh, when we were studying active or passive vibration isolation, then the two tasks were the following. First, we had to derive the solution of our equations of motion, or one could say first we had to derive the equations of motion and then to find the solution. That was the first task. And the second was we had to interpret that uh, solution. Namely, we had to compute a quantity that allows us to characterize the quality of vibration isolation. And in order to compute that quantity, we needed the solution of our system or of our equations of motion. And therefore, for transient excitation and for active vibration isolation, I would like to study these two tasks. In this video, the first task is determine the system response in order to obtain the force on the foundation because we are treating active vibration isolation. And the second task is determine or define characteristic quantities for vibration isolation to, to measure the vibration isolation quality. And of course, I would like to give you some examples, show you some applications, how to study the vibration isolation quality and which parameters to influence the vibration isolation quality, namely, of course, the stiffness of the foundation for transient excitation once again. So let's directly attack the first problem. So the determination of the system response for transient excitation. So for this, consider once again our rigid block of mass sitting on a foundation and the connection is given by a damping force. Well, you see the damping force here, the damping term here in that equation of motion and a spring term, so a restoring force given by a spring. And the equation of motion is then inertia term, damping term, stiffness term. And on the right hand side, we would have an excitation. And we will assume that that excitation acts directly on that mass. But it is not a harmonic excitation, but a transient excitation. And first, I would not like to study the general transient excitation, by, but I would like to represent the excitation by an impulse. So study the impulse response. So a very um, specific kind of excitation. And then to decompose a general transient excitation into a series of impulses and superpose the solution of each impulse from the impulse response to so the response to a single impulse. That's the idea. Due to the fact that the system is linear, I am allowed to apply the superposition principle and to superpose a general solution to a transient excitation to a series of impulses. So first step in that task is then to determine the response of that single degree of freedom oscillator to a single impulse. Now the question is, what is an impulse? A mathematical sense. Impulse is something that is of short duration. So the next question is, what is a short duration? The short duration is always measured or compared to some other kind of quantity in the system. And the only natural quantity we do have in our system, so the only system quantity involved here is, of course, the natural frequency. And from the natural frequency, we obtain the period. And re with respect to that period, the duration of an impact should be small. So small that for the initial conditions, we have the following two assumptions. Regarding the excitation itself, so the system should be at rest um, for t, let's say, less than zero. And during the duration of that impact, time is so small 
that there is no time for the system to adapt somehow to that impulse. So um, the displacement after the impulse and immediately before, so immediately before and immediately after the impulse should be the change, uh, the same, no change possible of the position, no time for any displacement. That means the displacement is still the zero immediately after the impulse. Now what happens to the velocity? If we look at the velocity, we have to apply conservation of momentum. So we compute the momentum, which is the integral over the impact force, so the force that happens between the beginning of the impulse at minus epsilon here assumed and the end of the impulse at plus epsilon and that momentum that we compute must be able to m times the velocity after the impulse minus the velocity before the impulse and that would be the law of the conservation of momentum. However, the velocity before the impulse is equal to zero because we assume that our system is at rest and then there is an impulse like a hammer stroke and suddenly the system um, vibrates because of that initial conditions, because of that excitation. So due to the fact that we have that short impact duration, we arrive at these initial conditions and these initial conditions can be translated to the fact that at time t equal to zero, because the impulse duration is so short that we can assume that it happens at time t equal to zero, we have zero displacement, but a given still unknown velocity i divided by m. i is still an unknown quantity because we do not know the law f as a function of t here. But that will not be a problem here. Uh, we will consider, consider unit impulse later on. So what we do is we consider the homogeneous equation of motion because f of t is of short impact duration, short duration, and after that impulse, the system is without any other excitation. So therefore, we consider the homogeneous equation and we solve that homogeneous equation of motion with respect to our initial conditions, no displacement, but a certain given velocity. So the solution of the homogeneous differential equation for x at 0 equal to 0 and velocity at time t equal to 0 equal to i divided by m is just given by the classical solution. If we assume, of course, a small damping, then we have that exponential function at the very beginning, which tells us that our system decreases uh, the, the the displacement increases exponentially in time and we have the cosine harmonic response and the sine harmonic response with at the moment two integration constants c sub 1 and c sub 2 and the two integration constants have to be obtained by adapting the solution the general solution to our initial conditions x0 equal 0 and velocity at time t equal to 0 equal to i divided by m. Well, if you apply these initial conditions, what you will see is that c sub 1 is equal to 0 and c sub 2 is just i divided by m omega 0 and the square root of 1 minus d squared because you have to take the derivative of that um, expression for the solution of the homogeneous equation and therefore you arrive at the 1 minus d squared square root in the denominator. So finally, if we insert c1 and c2 into that equation, we obtain the solution, the response of that single degree of freedom oscillator to a pulse of short duration. And this is given by i divided by m omega naught 1 minus d squared, square root, and then the exponential term here, and the sine harmonic. And now if we consider a unit impulse, then that quantity i would vanish here.
this is done on the next slide. So you obtain the following function, which is the response to a unit impulse. You divide the solution by the impulse i and you obtain the so-called rating function, which is then just 1 divided by m omega 0 square root 1 minus d squared in the exponential, exponentially decreasing term, and the harmonic function here. And that weighting function is set to 0 for negative times because the system is initially at rest. Then there is that hammer strike or pulse, and then uh, the system starts to vibrate, to oscillate with that behavior, displacement behavior here, given by the weighting function. Now, if we would like to represent a general transient excitation by a series of impulses, then of course these um, series of impulses or pulses do not happen at time t equal to zero, but at some other time. Let's say t equal to tau. So what would be the impulse response of a single degree of freedom oscillator to impulse that does not happen at time t equal to zero, but at some other time, let's say t equal to tau. Well, this is just a shift in time. And that shift in time can be represented by studying um, the function t minus tau, as given here. So t minus tau would then be obtained by inserting instead of t here the argument t minus tau. And then you would have an impulse at time t equal tau. You see that you obtain a zero then for t equal to tau. Let me give you an example. Let's study the excitation of ft as a series of pulses. And let's assume that the intensity of each, so for the general case, um, that, the uh, that the intensity of each impulse is given by delta ik. So we have a general transient excitation f um, of t, and we are represented by, by like a staircase um, um, approximation by piecewise constant terms of length delta dk and ftk is perhaps the mean value in that interval or some other value. So the intensity of the case and pulse is given by ftk times delta tk. The particular solution for that k impulse is given by delta ik times the unit impulse at time tau equal to tk. And due to the linearity, all these terms are summed up. And this is the superposition principle. So the particular solution is obtained by summing up all these terms. By the way, there isn't any other homogeneous solution, just that uh, particular solution here, because um, we have damping and we just consider the particular solution here. The answer to these single impulses by the superposition principle. Now, um, for delta ik, we can write ftk delta t, tk. Now let's consider the limit. So that was a staircase approximation, like a Riemannian sum. Let's consider the limit where delta tk goes to zero. So we make that time interval smaller and smaller. So the limit delta tk equal to zero, then we have that sum here, that sum Riemannian sum in the limit case will become an integral from zero to some time at the very end, let's say time t, where we want to compute that response. That response is the sum of the pulses occurring in the history of that oscillator, time history, until time t. And if we take the limit, then delta tk will become a dt uh, differential of time t. And well, in order to um, 
uh, distinguish that t from the uh, upper limit of that integration that occurs from zero to t, we denote that by tau again. So f tau g t minus tau d tau. So we will get the following integral from zero to t, t of f tau g t minus tau d tau, where g is the weighting function, the um, answer to a unit impulse occurring at time t equal to. This is a classical convolution integral that you might have seen in measurement and control theory. And it's an application well, that can be studied in measurement and control theory, but also applies, of course, to single degree of freedom oscillator and to the computation of the particular solution of a single degree of freedom oscillator under general transient excitation. Now, in order to give you an example, I would like to show you a short exercise. I would like to compute my solution, a particular solution for a sudden constant force that is for a kind of step function. So a step function looks as follow. The force, the excitation is zero until let's say time t equal zero or just less than zero. And then it jumps up to a constant value of f naught. Yeah. So it's like a switch. At time t equal to zero, someone has pushed the button or changed the switch from zero to on, and then you have to apply the force f naught. What happens if you compute the particular solution? Well, um, again, the particular solution is given by the weighting function, and uh, that is the step response to that step function, the response to that step function. And again, we consider the integral from zero to t of the force, which is then just given by the constant f naught, so can be written in front of the integral, and we just have to take the integral on the unit step function. Well, in order to do this, I apply a substitution. I substitute the argument t minus tau by sigma. Then I have to replace the differential. So instead of d tau, I have to consider minus d sigma that leads to the negative sign here. And of course, I also have to change the uh, integration limits. If you put sigma equal t minus tau and you insert tau equal to zero, you will find now t for the lower limit and zero for the upper limit. And of course, it's much better to change again the integration limits and then to cancel that with that negative sign in front of that integral. So to arrive at f naught integral from zero to t g sigma d sigma. And now I have to compute that integral and I would like as a reminder, uh, recall that g of sigma is then given by the unit impulse response 1 divided by m omega naught 1 minus d squared and square root, the exponential of minus omega naught d, and now t is replaced by a sigma or tau is replaced by a sigma or t minus tau is replaced by a sigma and sine omega d times sigma, where omega d is the natural frequency of the damped vibrator. So it's omega naught multiplied by the square root of one minus d squared. Well, that's a technical problem to compute that integral and I will directly state the solution. And the solution is given by the following expression. So we have our f naught divided by m omega zero squared, one minus, and then you have the exponential, d divided by one minus d squared sine omega dt plus cosine omega dt. So for example, if you insert here d equal to zero, then of course you will not see that sine harmonic term. Uh, that exponential term will be equal to one. The cosine will also be equal to one. You would obtain one minus one which is zero. So you would start with the zero here for that particular solution, which makes sense because remember at time t equals zero, you just 
pushed the button or the switch whatsoever and switched on the force. Yeah? So it needs some time until uh, the displacement ramp up. And you see that this ramp up behavior is given here um, by the, that second term, one minus that second term. You, so you see an exponentially uh, well decreasing behavior here, which means an uh, exponentially increasing ramp up because you have one minus that exponential term here. Yeah? Okay, the step response now can be written for a unit jump. If we divide by F naught, then we have the step response, which is just that particular solution divided by F naught. So to get a quantity that reflects the fact that we had some kind of excitation here with F naught. Now, the question is, that's nice. We are able to compute that particular solution for the case of transient excitation, for the general case, or in that nice example for a kind of switch function or step function to get a unit jump response for our step response function. Now the question is the second task, task, what can we learn from that solution? How can we apply that solution in order to assess the vibration isolation quality of my system, which is composed by a machine, by a rigid block of mass M, and a foundation. And in between there is this layer of um, connection between machine and foundation. And that layer is composed usually by a spring and a damper. Well, if we think again of these assessment parameters we had before, then it was quite natural to consider the force exerted on the ground, which can be computed, of course, also from that displacement here, and to relate the maximum force to the amplitude of the harmonic excitation. Now, in our case, we do not have a harmonic excitation, but a transient excitation. So how can we extend or generalize that result to transient excitation? For transient excitation, there is no amplitude here. But that amplitude for harmonic excitation plays a certain role. Namely, it denotes the maximum value of the excitation. The excitation is a fluctuating, is a harmonic excitation, and the maximum value was F0. So the idea is, in that case here, for transient excitation, to just take the maximum value of Ft, of the excitation history, and to relate that value to the ground force, or relate the ground force to the maximum value of the um, of the force of the excitation force history. So for that example, for example, for the switch function, it would simply be F naught here. And this is the first parameter we could study. It's called the residual amplitude ratio. You study the maximum of the ground force, you take the maximum of the uh, excitation force, you compute the ratio, and you are happy. Shielding occurs if that ratio is less than one. Otherwise, you are perhaps less happy, but you are also happy if that ratio remains small, of course. Yeah? So, shielding would occur if that ratio is less than one. Let's make an example. Or let's a little bit continue that example, but modify it a little bit. So do not consider a switch force, but consider a rectangular pulse excitation. So an excitation that is again zero for negative times, so for something that is in the past. Then someone pushed the button and uh, the excitation jams to con constant term F0. But after a certain time T sub S, the excitation force is again zero. Now, what would be the particular solution for this case? So as you know, for time t equal to zero, the system is at rest. There is no external force, so the system remains at rest. So for time t equal to zero, 
the particular solution is zero. For the time between zero and Ts, the solution is given by that unit step function. So by a step function, uh, which is now simplified to the undamped case, you can see that there's no exponential function here, no exponentially decreasing function here, because we are considering the undamped single degree of freedom oscillator, capital D, is now equal to zero. Well, and after that rectangular pulse, the system is just as the same as the homogeneous equation of motion. So there is no external force. So we take the um, uh, displacement and the velocity at Ts at the end of that rectangular pulse as the initial condition for a homogeneous os for a, a single degree of freedom oscillator um, without any external force. So we are studying the homogeneous solution again, but for these initial conditions, for initial conditions um, obtained from the end of that second period here, uh, where we had the step function for the undamped system. Now the question is, we have to identify the maximum of the ground force and we have to compare that value with the maximum of the excitation force. The maximum of the excitation force is quite simple, it's F0, but what is the maximum of the um, ground force here? Well, if time Ts is less than half of the period of that single degree of freedom oscillator, then what happens um, for that rectangular pulse? If you look at that equation of the cosine function, well, for time t equal to zero, this, this function is zero. And then uh, with the decrease of the cosine, that term in parenthesis ramps up until half of the period because at half of the period the cosine function is equal to minus one and that term here is maximum, namely it's F twice F0 divided by M omega zero squared. Now if time Ts is left than, less than half of the period, then the maximum value occurs of the ground force occurs directly as at the end of that second part of the motion, so at the end of that pulse. So it occurs from the initial condition of that second period, because then this harmonic motion of that uh, last period starts of that oscillator, and there is no chance that the pointer, that that complex pointer has a, a longer length than the Initial conditions at the end of that second order, the, the values of the at the end of the second period of that period here of the pulse period that serve as initial condition for that last part of the motion. So the maximum will be given by the length of that complex pointer, which is given by XPTS squared plus the velocity at TS divided by M naught squared, so the cosine part and the sine part again, for Ts less than half of the period, or so the period computed with respect to the natural frequency of that single degree of freedom oscillator. So this translates directly to a result for the ground force. So for the ground force, we then have to multiply uh, that value by C. So take C times that value. And um, then uh, if you insert the cosine and sine functions here, you obtain um, F naught and the square root of one minus cosine omega zero T S. If you insert for XP uh, that expression at time t equal ts at the end of that second part of the solution. Here you get one minus cosine omega 
0 ts and that term is squared and you obtain if you take the derivative um, xp of so it's simply the derivative of minus cosine omega t you obtain sine squared omega naught ts so the derivative at time t equal to ts so what can be seen if we compare that to f naught then of course if we relate fb max to f not the maximum ground force then what remains is thus just the square root and let's discuss this square root a little bit more detail on the next slide so that was the expression we obtain um, if here we apply binomial formula and then apply classical trigonometric formula we obtain the following relation to um, times 1 minus cosine omega naught ts and we take the square root of that expression times f naught and this is then equal to 2 f naught sine omega naught ts divided by 2. We can further simplify that expression so for the residual force um, ratio we would, pardon, we would get the following result v sub r 2 sine omega naught ts divided by 2 but we can simplify that result and look whether shielding occurs if omega naught ts half is less than pi divided by 6 because if omega naught ts divided by 2 is less than pi divided by 6 that sine function is less than half and 2 times half is just one so then we have shielding so we know that the longer the shock duration the lower is the natural frequency for shielding because as you can see we have the product on the left hand side of omega naught ts ts the shock duration omega naught the natural frequency the product of omega naught and ts must be less than pi divided by 3 if you multiply the whole equation inequality by 2 and so this yields a direct result for the product of the natural frequency times ts that is the longer the system uh, the longer the shock duration the softer the spring c divided by f because you need a low natural frequency so again the correct answer here is you need a rather soft spring okay uh, now that would be one way to characterize um, the vibration isolation quality by looking at the residual force or residual amplitude ratio here by considering the maximum value of the ground force and divided by the maximum value of the excitation force. In many cases, the important question for the engineer is what happens if I modify the stiffness by inserting, for example, additional springs? Would this pay off? Would, this, would there be any benefit by making the foundation even softer? Because you pay a certain price for it, right? So, a second assessment parameter would be the so-called relative isolation efficiency. And the question that is at the basis of that parameter is the question, is it possible to reduce the maximum force that is exerted on the foundation by adding additional springs to the system? And as we are dealing with an efficiency, the parameter is given as follows. You consider the ground force of the system and you consider the ground force of the same system by having some additional springs plus f and you relate it it's a relative quantity you relate it to the original again to the ground force of the original system which yields one minus the ratio of fb g plus f from springs and divided by fbg the letter f for springs relates to the german word feeder for spring 
So that quantity is an efficiency in the sense that if that quantity is equal to zero, then that ratio is equal to one. So you have added additional springs, but there is no effect on the ground force. That's a pity. So then it makes no sense to add these springs to the system, of course. And then that ratio is equal to one. The whole term is equal to one minus one equal to zero. So your efficiency drops down to zero. On the opposite, if that term vanishes, so it vanishes because the numerator is zero, regardless of the denominator then, except it's zero again, but that wouldn't make much sense, right? So you added some spring and you were able to bring down the force, well, maybe not equal to zero, but very close to zero, the ground force close to zero, then you have a very high efficiency and you would like, of course, in that case to add these springs to the system to maybe a layer between the machine and the foundation. Let's study an example. Let's study again the undamped system under a rectangular part. So the solution we have, um, we, we obtained again, and let's in that case simplify that solution again a little bit. So um, we insert the leading term here, which is just that sine function, uh, the amplitude that we had before, we just um, cancel because it appears in the numerator and in the denominator. So if we compute the relative isolation efficiency for that example, the example we studied before, then what we get is just the ratio of these sine functions. Now, as it's so difficult to, um, to consider the the ratio of two sine functions. Let's consider first the argument. So exemplify what are these natural frequencies and um, then um, simplify that expression for short pulse durations to replace the sine function by its argument. If Ts is small, so if Ts is small, then the argument of the sine function will be also small. So um, first of all, let's study the natural frequency. The natural frequency um, in the denominator is just given by the ratio of, well, I call that stiffness here C, G, so the ground stiffness, the original stiffness of the ground of the foundation be divided by M. Now, if you add an additional layer of springs, you would have a serious connection, these additional springs and then the original stiffness. So what you get is then you have to modify the stiffness by um, replacing the, the stiffness by the appropriate result from a series connection, which is then CG by CF, the stiffness of the additional springs, and you divide by the sum of CG plus CF, and you still divide by M, right? Okay, now let's look at these terms if we replace the sine function by the arguments. So if we replace for short pulse duration the sine function by its argument, omega naught Ts in the two cases, then of course the pulse duration will cancel and you just get the ratio of these two natural frequencies, which if you make the computation is just the ratio of one divided by Cf, Cg divided by Cf plus one. What do you learn about the relative isolation efficiency? Once again, you have a high relative isolation frequency efficiency if that second term vanishes. The second term will vanish if the denominator is large. The denominator is very large is if Cf is much less than Cg. Keep in mind that the Cf are the additional springs. So what is the stiffness of these additional springs of this layer of additional springs that you insert into your system, machine, original connection, foundation. That layer of springs that you insert must have a very small stiffness, so these springs must be very, very soft. And this brings me not only to this end of that video, but also to, to the conclusion of these three videos on vibration isolation to that general answer, I would say, to the question, what should be an optimal 
foundation, an optimal connection between the machine and the foundation. Well, the general answer in most of the cases is make the connection as soft as possible. In parentheses, if this is not possible, try to make it as rigid as possible, so as stiff as possible, nearly rigid. Well, with that general conclusion, I would like to close the chapter and thank you very much for your attention. In the next chapter, we will move to a completely different subject, namely to rotor dynamic systems, namely to bending vibrations of a simple rotor dynamic model, which is in a Jeffcott rotor or in Germany, it was in France. It's called the Le Laval rotor. See you there. And once again, thank you very much for your attention.